On May 23, 2011, a powerful rotating thunderstorm called a supercell could produce a tornado at any moment near El Reno, Oklahoma. The stronger storms may also produce tornadoes. Tornado sirens scream through town, but no tornado touches down. It was another false alarm. About the same time the next day, again near El Reno, another powerful supercell is in progress and a tornado warning is issued. This time, a killer is on the ground. Your life may depend on it once again. Tornado warnings are in effect dangerous. Deadly tornado outbreak is underway. With wind speeds estimated over 200 miles per hour, this tornado earns the highest rating on the enhanced Fujita scale, a rare EF-5. Everything's destroyed. Everything's killed. For over an hour, this tornado will carve a 63-mile path across rural Oklahoma. Despite early warnings, nine people lost their lives and over 150 were injured. Many people ignore tornado warnings because of too many false alarms. Others don't respond because they don't see a tornado. There it is, coming right this way. Those people gotta get out of here. When they finally can, it's often too late. The National Weather Service has the difficult task of trying to warn the public, but because we still don't know why one supercell produces a tornado and why another does not, they have to warn the majority of supercells. For the National Weather Service, it's damned if they do and damned if they don't. To reduce the cried wolf effect, we're going to have to figure out why one supercell produces violent tornadoes and why another does not. Easier said than done. Every spring, scientists risk their lives hoping to collect the data needed, scanning killer storms with radar point blank, and by attempting to place instruments in the path of tornadoes. And with all the probing and scanning, the picture is still vague at best. Atmospheric scientist Dr. Lee Orff has taken a different approach by successfully growing superstorms that produce EF5 tornadoes in a supercomputer. After decades of wandering in the dark, this technology has brought an alien anatomy to light. We now have the tools to see through the skin of the storm into individual organs and an organized system of currents. Like a child opening a machine for the first time, we can now observe the components that make it tick. And what the machine is telling us is that many of our previous theories were dead wrong. But is this superstorm growing and living inside a computer a true representation of nature? One of the ways to help validate these incredible simulations is to compare them with actual storm footage. We are now here with atmospheric scientist at the University of Wisconsin, Dr. Lee Orff. Hello, Lee. Greetings from Texas. Hi, Hank. It's great to hear from you up here in Wisconsin. Could you tell us what you do and what the main objective of your work is? Sure. Um, I'm an atmospheric scientist. I study supercell thunderstorms and tornadoes, but I use supercomputers to simulate supercell thunderstorms at pretty much the highest resolution possible with today's hardware. I have access to the Blue Water supercomputer at the University of Illinois, and it is able to crunch up to 10 quintillion calculations per second, and it allows us to simulate supercells at resolutions that capture things like tornado genesis and a lot of the different smaller scale of vortical features that occur in supercells that lead up to tornadoes forming and probably involve the tornado's life cycle itself. What I think the public needs to understand, if I understand correctly, is that you are programming the laws of physics into a computer and then just hitting go, and then the computer grows the thunderstorm. All of those models are obeying the laws of physics as we understand them as human beings. Once they go, there's no human interaction with the model until it makes its forecast. The initial conditions for the model that we took were from a pretty faithful sampling of the air that would have been along the right flank for a specific storm on May 24, 2011. And the result was we got a storm that has some very similar traits to the actual storm that occurred on May 24, 2011. So we've got these big storms that have actually occurred, and we're going to try to sort of bring them to life within the computer so that we can better understand what's going on. 
In the past, I would have thought that a tornado is composed mostly of warm inflow. Yep. And your yep. models are suggesting that the cold pool is what is feeding the tornado. Yes, absolutely. So let me ask you first, Hank, why did you think that in the first place? Just, you know, what was your thinking? Because warm air is more buoyant, so you just assume that warm air is going to be more easily lifted. Right. Also, when you're in the path of a tornado, more often than not, you find yourself in the warm inflow that is streaming in, you know, and around. Right. And then also, when a storm becomes outflow dominant, there's no more tornado. Right, exactly. First of all, I assumed the same darn thing before this simulation. It is counterintuitive to think that the cooler air is being lifted at over, you know, 150 miles an hour, half a kilometer above the ground, which our simulations show, which is mind-blowing. And yes, our simulations of this particular storm, May 24th, 2011, in all cases, when you trace the air with trajectories and you drop these little parcels, you put them in front of the storm, they'll enter the updraft, but they won't go into the tornado. The parcels that you drop in the cold pool, especially certain regions of it, they take a beeline right for the tornado and get pulled up into the tornado circulation. Now, the fact that we're not seeing any air coming from the warm side to feed the tornado is an interesting result. And if it turns out to be true, I think it's an important result. Near a supercell, there are many fascinating things to observe that often overshadow the inflow band. Your animations are suggesting there's a lot more to the inflow tail than just a thin cloud streaming into the mesocyclone. Yes. First of all, the fact that it produces a tail cloud is good because tail clouds are common in supercells along the forward flank. They're not always there, but that interface is where a bunch of interesting things can happen. Let me talk about a couple of the things we've found in our simulation that I don't think has been seen in Mother Nature. We have found very interesting organization of vorticity in the cold pool of our simulated storm. And one of the features we've identified, or at least we've given it a name, is called a streamwise vorticity current. And this is sort of a, you could call a helically flowing tube of air. It's sort of lifted, tilted into the storm's updraft where it becomes rotating cyclonically in the same direction as the air in the mesocyclone and any subsequent cyclonic tornado. So this feature is one that shows up in our simulations of the 24 May 2011 environment in all the simulations we've done. So one of the tools that we have used with our simulation is to place these air parcels uh, sort of like chaff. You just release them every second or so in a certain region of the storm to see where that air will go. We'll follow the temperature, the humidity, the precipitation, and the pressure along the path of the parcel and the forces acting on it. And that's a very powerful method for trying to untangle the physics of what's going on. We see dozens and dozens of these little vortices along the forward flank that merge together, that sometimes just get assimilated into the cyclonic flow of the main tornado. If they're anticyclonic, they get twisted around the tornado's periphery and spun and stretched and tilted and all sorts of cool stuff. I know that some observational studies by Bluestein and Worman and some of those guys have shown that these vortices are out there. You can't see them with the naked eye. Sometimes they'll spin up some dust if you're lucky, but oftentimes there's all these vortices in the air that we cannot see with our eye. I'm thinking of creative ways to use videography like what you produce, Hank. Are there ways for us to get some more information from the video? If you're lucky enough to get something kicked up, some dust and all that, then you can start to look at the full three-dimensional wind field. When you're underneath the storm and let's say it starts off and it's got kind of a linear mode and then you see that RFD start to march around, yep. it's usually go time. And yep. that's when you position and then it won't be long often when the show really starts, which is why we generally think that this RFD is a mechanism in tornado genesis, but it might be all of these things working together that are also driving the RFD. It could be the SVC, like you say, that's driving the RFD in sync coming around, perhaps. Perhaps. You raise a very good point. It's, it's a matter of correlation versus causation. I mean, this is still the leading theory of tornado genesis, is that a downdraft impinges the ground, it spreads out like a downburst does. It forces a convergence of existing vorticity, and once you get it stretched, boom, there's your tornado. Now, even if the RFD 
is an important source of tornado genesis. I don't see how downdrafts in the RFD can maintain a tornado because the RFD is a very sporadic place. It's not like there's this constant stream of downward air going down nice and smooth. It's much more transient and these downdrafts happen all over the place in their RFD. So perhaps there's something else going on that is causing the RFD behavior and causing the tornado. You know, so the RFD is more of a symptom than a cause. And again, I don't know that I'm right. When I look at your storm, there's one of your animations where we start, you know, in the stratosphere and we come down through the tropopause. You see the overshooting yep. top. I've been observing these storms now for 20 years. I've seen eight EF4s and one officially rated EF5. In my opinion, that's a supercell. <laughs> All the features move and behave like the organelles, if you will, I've seen in the field. The rolling plumes of the updraft, the tumbling mammatus in the back shear region, right. the wall cloud appearance, and the tail cloud streaming in along the forward flank. The laminar, wind sculpted region of the mesocyclone and the demarcation into the turbulent region. Tornado, it's multiple vortices, the horizontal vortices riding up the tornado. The way the RFD wraps around the tornado and sometimes clears and wraps again. Even the anticyclonic tornadoes in the vicinity, I've observed in numerous supercells. It looks very good, as you say. All the different component parts that you see in the field, they show up in the simulation. But as far as calling it a day, in science, we have to write journal articles that get into the nitty gritty physics, the quantitative analysis, and that is what we haven't done yet. But it's hard to argue against some of the animations that you see. When you see that, you know, the things that you see in the field are getting right, like you say, the, the flanking line looks right, the laminar transition to, to turbulent, it's pretty compelling just to look at that and say, okay, well, that happened in a model simulation, So, and a model simulation contains all this physics and such, so it's likely that the simulation is not broken. You know, that's the worst fear I would have as a scientist, is someday we discover a bug in the model, and that invalidates our results. Well, I don't see that happening. There's no tricks. There's no Hollywood graphics going on. It's all manifestations of the data that's on my hard drive. How can actual storm footage help your cause? By validating what the model shows. Because some of the most valuable information for me personally is looking at the storm structure and looking at how it changes. Because I can put your time lapse next to my animation and I can compare. So that is crucial. The best way I, to help people like us who are trying to do real storm research is to put it on a tripod. <laughs> Please don't shake the camera around. That just drives me nuts. It's hard to see things. If you see little tiny vortices anywhere outside of the tornado, I'm very interested. Who knows? I'm not saying that it's definitely going to advance the field, but I'm saying that it already has helped me understand more about real storms by looking at footage like yours and other people because then I can compare the model with what is being seen in the field in the one area where we overlap, and that's in the cloud. Well, not that I need it, but I'm definitely more inspired to get out there and get some of these angles and yeah. uh, and send them your way. Absolutely. And, and you know, I we've talked about this earlier, but, you know, maybe I can take an angle on my simulation that is what you took in your video, and we can do some comparisons. To even collaborate with you yeah. is yeah. a whole lot of fun and uh, excitement for me. I mean, I'm by no means a scientist, but by contributing to the field is extremely rewarding. Oh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this, and I take this seriously, too. I take this as seriously as any collaboration I'd have. If you'd like to know more about Dr. Leorf's fascinating research, you can visit him at orf.media, 
O-R-F dot media, or check out his YouTube channel.